Good morning. My name is Aditya Patnaik. I am an investment advisor at Sprott. The following excerpts are from a discussion I recorded with Rick Rule on the 12th of March, 2024. The focus of our discussion is primarily on the natural gas sector, uh, with an emphasis on opportunities in the Canadian natural gas space. I begin by asking Rick about his views on the current natural gas prices and the reasons for his bullishness on the sector over the medium term. The phrase that investors need to keep in their mind is that the cure for low prices is low prices. The cure for high prices is high prices. Beyond that, you have to understand something about the fundamentals, both on the supply side and on the demand side. If you look on the supply side with regards to the U.S. in, predict in particular, we have production increases in natural gas that have exceeded the investments that have been made in gathering, transmission, processing, and liquefaction, which is to say we have a real gas glut that is really a consequence of byproduct gas production from oil production, and that particularly in the Permian Basin in West Texas. The manifestation of that is the fact that West Texas wellhead prices are a buck sixty or a buck seventy per million British thermal units. While that same gas landed at Rotterdam or Shanghai or Tokyo is selling at eight or eight and a half dollars per million British thermal units. Ex tax, it costs about a buck and a half a million to get that gas from the Permian to Rotterdam. Uh, so what you have is a, a basically a five dollar or five and a half dollar arbitrage uh, between those two markets. And you have an industry that is an industry spending billions of dollars to attack that delta. The timing in terms of resumption of gas sales from Russia to Europe is anybody's guess. And in the interim, uh, liquefied seaborne natural gas will be an important way to deal with that. Probably more importantly, though, in the intermediate term, uh, two things are occurring. There's beginning to be a realization, even among the Greens, that while the Greens would prefer us not to burn anything, substituting natural gas for coal generates a net benefit in terms of carbon generation and also particulate generation. At the same time that that's occurring, a different form of nearshoring is occurring. European fertilizer manufacturers, as an example, uh, and petrochemical manufacturers are relocating en masse to the United States and Canada. Uh, and that builds a, a type of demand that is a 20 or 30 year demand, which I think is very important. The market that I'm talking about in terms of natural gas isn't a market that I see 20 years from now or 30 years from now, first of all, because I'll be dead. Uh, and second of all, because I can't see that far in the future. Uh, but I can see, to some extent, five to ten years into the future. And that is very bullish for natural gas, particularly ironically bullish for natural gas if we see an increase in real interest rates, which will increase the cost of capital around shale drilling and lead to a decline in byproduct production of natural gas. I'm not saying this is going to occur, but if it did – that would be bullish. At the same time, the incredible investment that you've seen in infrastructure in North American natural gas is important because the United States becomes, with the possible exception of Qatar uh, and Australia, the most reliable supplier of natural gas. So I want to talk about Canadian natural gas, particularly the investment opportunities in the space and whether you see them linked to the global picture in natural gas or whether you see any specific opportunities on the horizon for what has been a relatively isolated market since 2017, when we started seeing a big disconnect between what was happening in the Alberta market and was what was happening outside at the Henry Hub and the other locations. If I was to just set the scene here, so what I found very interesting was that we were producing close to 16 BCF of gas in, in the Western Canadian Basin 20 years ago, and we're producing about the same amount today. 
the issue with the Western Canadian sedimentary basin is is essentially the price discovery has not been allowed for that gas because they haven't had export facilities in place. Do you see this situation changing for Canada at all, given the political situation there? Or do you see that market being particularly idiosyncratic? I do see it as idiosyncratic. And I would suggest that the Canadian gas sector, while cheaper than the United States, is a speculative market rather than an investment market. Uh, Canada, for political purposes, uh, has decided not to export Canadian natural gas. The reasons for it are inexplicable to me, but I don't vote in Canada. Uh, at the same time that the U.S. gas industry, uh, at least indirectly as a consequence of byproduct gas in particular, has exploded. The traditional Canadian natural gas markets, which is to say the U.S. West Coast, which is now serviced by the Permian Basin and the U.S. Northeast, which is serviced by the Marcellus, means that a lot of the Canadian export infrastructure is redundant because the U.S. market is well served. While the United States has embarked very aggressively on building in, uh, export infrastructure, both liquefied uh, uh, infrastructure and also pipeline infrastructure, paradoxically selling U.S. natural gas to Mexico, uh, the Canadians uh, haven't acted in the same fashion. Uh, now, there are some moves of uh, uh, afoot to develop Canadian LNG export facilities in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and at Wood Fiber uh, in the lower mainland of British Columbia. And that will help. But the other thing that hasn't happened in Canada to the same degree as it has in the United States has been the development of uh, gas-oriented fabric uh, fabricators. Uh, the expansion, as an example, of the U.S. fertilizer industry and petrochemical industry has not been matched in Canada. Uh, in fact, uh, Canada ranks, I think, uh, dead last among the G30. Uh, in capital investments relative to GDP, which is to say that across the length and breadth of Canada, productive investment uh, in manufacturing and production uh, capacity in all sectors, not merely in the energy sector, has been very poor from a global point of view. And the consequence of that is, as you suggest, the Canadian market for natural gas is in some substantial measure stranded. Part of the speculation around Canadian natural gas, well, there's three parts of the speculation. The first is that even at today's prices, the enterprise value relative to the net present value of Canadian producers is fairly inexpensive on a North American basis. And the potential for production expansion or the market there is much greater in Canada than it is in the United States. But the next part of the equation is very, very, very speculative, which is to say, will the Canadian voter return to sanity uh, and stop voting for political alternatives that are economically destructive? In particular, the attitudes in Eastern Canada expressed by the Liberal Party and the Bloc, and the Bloc Québécois uh, mean that Canada is creating regulatory roadblocks to the industry that is the most efficient industry in Canada on a global basis in terms of generating social benefit. And I have some hope that Canadian voters will express the same frustration with this that they expressed 20 or 25 years ago in the regime change that uh, accompanied the excesses of the first Trudeau's reign in Canada. Uh, admittedly, uh, an investment philosophy which requires voters to be rational is always a speculative philosophy. When you say the Canadian market is more speculative, you are speculating on the price of Canadian natural gas increasing because of better egress in the future? Yes, uh, and less political interference. I don't think that in the next 10 years that you will see industries in Canada expand, that expand the domestic market for Canadian natural gas. So there will be, have to be outlets around that natural gas. 
my belief is that you will again see a disparity of uh, a buck or a buck and a half per million BTU between the United States and the Canadian natural gas markets uh, three or four years from now, which will be sufficient to begin to increase the ability of American markets to absorb Canadian natural gas, even as we export uh, American natural gas in the liquefied market and also the overland Mexican market. In other words, I think that Canadian natural gas may be able to reintroduce itself to, in particular, the U.S. Uh, West Coast and the upper Midwest, even as it displaces gas, uh, particularly in the Gulf Coast, that gets uh, used for domestic purposes or used for uh, LNG and CNG trade or is transported to Mexico. If this additional LNG capacity does materialize, which is about 10, 12 BCF per day, uh, including a few Bs in Canada, I think that that could certainly impact this market. But it is a 2025, post-2025 phenomenon. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, Meanwhile, I know you don't let me name names, but a couple of Canadian natural gas stocks that uh, I own, uh, are paying seven, eight percent, nine percent dividends while I wait. Uh, in other words, you get paid to wait. I, I did a deep dive on one of those companies for this part of our discussion, and I was looking back over the last twenty years at what was happening at this company. The first thing that struck me from an investor point of view is that the enterprise value is the the same as it was in two thousand six. Uh, the difference is it was producing 20,000 barrels then. Today, it's producing 120,000 barrels. There are a few things that have happened since 2006. The first part was post-2009, there was obviously a lot of cheap capital available, and they were spending more than they were bringing in in terms of the difference between the capex and the funds from operations. So they grew arguably irresponsibly for several years. Uh, then the price collapsed, and that affected them in a negative way for a few years. Uh, and now they are again back in a situation where they can maintain production levels at, at where they are today. I see two main things that have happened. At first, these companies were not growing responsibly, and the second is ESG became a problem for investors. Do you see other reasons why we're trading at this enterprise value today, 20 years later? Uh I think that there is an ESG patina around the oil and gas business. Uh, and as a consequence of that, while investors may or may not share the philosophical predisposition of the big thinkers, they're afraid of it. Uh, both Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden have suggested that we're in the sunset years for the oil and gas industry. And in fact, peak demand will occur in 2032. And I think the consequence of that is that people believe that the net present values associated with the PDP and PUD reserves of companies like this uh, should take into account uh, declining demand for hydrocarbons post-2030. I believe that peak demand will occur in 2065 or so. So I'm assigning net present values, or put differently, the um, the terminal value or tail value at the at the end of a conventional uh, net pre- NPV calculation. My suspicion is that 2032, the net present value will be the same as the net present value is in 2024. So I'm suggesting that as a consequence of a misheld premise namely the demise of fossil fuels, that the oil and gas business in North America is priced at perhaps half what it should be priced at. Uh, The fact that it's unpopular elates me as an investor. It's proof that my thesis is likely correct. When you're valuing an oil and gas business, Uh, versus valuing a gold mining company. They are both depleting resources, uh, but there are certainly different considerations. And I I was interested on any specific differences when you look at these two 
uh, businesses in terms of valuing them? Well, I think you have the most important metric up in front of you, which is to say enterprise value versus net present value. I think it's important, too, that you use the right discount rate, which is to say a 10. Most of the investment banks now that are discounting free cash flows are discounting free cash flows at five, which I think is a mistake. So you've used uh, a conservative discount rate, uh, and you have still come up with the fact that the business is selling uh, at a discount to net present value. Uh, with the exception of four or five years, when the cost of capital was arguably sub-zero, which is to say when its enterprise value was greater than its net present value, um, the company has been uh, relatively successful uh, in recycle, which is to say uh, taking a, a dollar's worth of production and turning that into more than a dollar's worth of reserve which is to say it's reasonable to expect, looking backwards over 20 years, that they will be able to use the free cash flow to increase enterprise value. And they're able to do it while maintaining a, a fairly decent balance sheet. And by the way, a balance sheet that's increased, that's improved markedly over the last four years. That's what you look at. Uh, when you're done with those three, you begin to look at uh, the work that Marty Whitman has always done on capital intensive cyclical businesses, where you talk about the difference between trough and peak cash flows at commodity prices that reflect the difference between trough and peak. And if you assign yourself uh, a different price for hydrocarbons five years out, uh, that NPV number that you're using uh, looks very different. At the same time that the capitalized value of uh, market expectations increases, as Marty Whitman says, when you begin to uh, approach peaks in the commodity cycle, not only are the free cash flows much greater than you would have expected during the troughs, but the appreciation of those cash flows also demands a higher multiple. Earnings and book value are not of primary significance to you from a valuation point of view then? Book is often very illusory uh, because it doesn't take into account the quality of the book. Uh, if, as an example, uh, Aditya, uh, the business spend $10 million to drill uh, an oil well, and of that $10 million, 60% uh, of it was uh, intangible, uh, that $10 million well would be added to the book at $4 million. And that $4 million would be depreciated out of existence over five years. But if the net present value of that well, which is to say the producible reserves over a 10-year time frame, were worth $20 million, the disparity between the tangible book, which is to say $4 million, depreciated in a straight line, 20% a year over five years, relative to the net present value of the free cash flows of $20 million, means that book in oil and gas is often a very illusory number. You need to look at book in conjunction with recycle ratio uh, and proved undeveloped locations. Uh, that's a very, very, very important metric. And by the way, if you apply that discipline to the Canadian oil and gas business as a whole, what you'll see is that the industry is barely making enough sustainable cap sustaining capital investments to support current production. Uh, when you look at companies like uh, Pato or Tourmaline in isolation, you see a very different circumstance. You see producers that are making relative to their historic recycle ratio and relative to the proved undeveloped locations that they have on the books. Uh, that are sufficient to maintain uh, production and assuming that prices stay firm margin. One of your biggest reasons for being bullish on the sector is the underinvestment in the space. 
I pointed out in the example that I raised that there was a period from 2009 to 2014 where there was a lot of spending in excess of cash flow that was being generated by the business. And then prices collapsed 2015 onward. That situation changed dramatically. This is a graph for the Canadian oil and gas uh, sector. This is capital reinvestment levels. And we're certainly seeing that trend of lower capital investment overall. But I guess the question is we're looking at resource plays versus conventional oil and gas. Rig efficiencies have gone up a lot. Well efficiencies have changed dramatically over the last four or five years. Do you think this picture is misrepresenting the situation for uh, a sector which is primarily being driven by unconventional plays? Uh, I think you miss an important variable, which is to say that the industry's cost of capital measured by the difference between net present value and market capitalization meant that the industry's cost of capital during the low interest rate regime 2010 to 2016 was negative, which is to say the market was subsidizing CapEx. <laughs> uh, that isn't the case anymore. Uh, I get the part about efficiencies. Uh, I get the part about the industry coming to understand the Duvernay and the Cardium. Uh, I get all of that. I, I don't think any of that is as important, A, as cost of capital, and B, the political consideration uh, of both the investment community and the oil and gas community. I think, too, the biggest deterioration in sustaining capital investments is taking place outside of North America. It's taking place at places like Pedavesa. Uh, at Gazprom, at Pemex, uh, you are seeing uh, both uh, European domiciled multinationals and national oil companies around the world spending at levels that are absolutely incapable of maintaining production. And if you assume that in large measure, the global market for hydrocarbons is a global market, granted, Canada particularly with regards to natural gas, is a temporary exception. What you need to look at is the global flow of funds into sustaining capital and new project investment. North America, uh, in particular Texas, uh, but also the unconventional part of Canada, is an anomaly on a global basis. For the final segment of our call today, I would like to bring this discussion back to the topic of gold. The move in gold is taking place quietly and stealthily. Uh, we're still seeing daily net outflows from, from the physical ETFs and mining company valuations also remain extremely disconnected from the gold price levels that we're seeing today. Now, there appears to be a catalyst on the horizon for this market for the gold sector uh, in the form of interest rate cuts this year. Uh, I was interested in your thoughts on the clear lack of enthusiastic buyers in the sector, despite an obvious catalyst for the space this year. As you know, Aditya, uh, I have a bank in front of the FDIC, and so I'm talking to FDIC pe people and Fed people fairly consistently. And at the Fed in particular, uh, there is internal opposition to an interest rate cut. The Fed believes themselves to be the only organization that stands between the U.S. dollar and a precipice. They don't see any fiscal discipline uh, in Congress. And they don't see any discipline in the presidency. I'm not saying to suggest that I have inside information. But my suspicion is that a rate cut uh, is not necessarily as eminent as people believe it to be. But I think for the arithmetic of gold to work, we don't need a rate cut. The reason I believe that is controversial, but I think it needs to be stressed. People's understanding of inflation uh, is, is uh, constrained because they haven't had a fear of inflation for a very long time and they haven't studied it. For most people, their view of inflation uh, is demonstrated by the consumer price index, the CPI. And the CPI is not a cost of living index. We've talked about this before. And that means that people's uh, understanding of inflation, uh, their quantification of inflation is wrong. Uh, 
I would suggest to you, Aditya, that if you back-tested the basket of goods and services that you buy, I tried to do it for my own, uh, that what you'll find is that the purchasing power of your wages, your salary, uh, and your savings is declining uh, at more like 7% than 2.7%. Uh, well, the moniker, if you will, the icon for inflation is the CPI, uh, I think the reality of inflation is very different. If past this prologue, uh, it took five years of experience with inflation, 1967 to 1972, before people really noticed the impact of inflation on their living standards. When they noticed it, they noticed it in earnest. And I would suggest that this deterioration in purchasing power relative to the interest rate paid on savings has only become a problem in U.S. society this time since 2022. If passed as prologue, it may take five years, uh, which is to say two and a half years from now, before fear of inflation becomes broadly based in the United States. In my experience, the condition precedent to an increase in the gold price in particular is the realization because of negative real, not nominal interest rates, but real interest rates, that the purchasing power of people's fiat-denominated savings uh, and their wages and salaries are insufficient to maintain their standard of living. And I don't think that realization has struck Americans yet, but I think that realization is with us today. I've now graded over 80,000 investment portfolios, Aditya, and you learn a lot by looking at large amounts of data. And the lesson that has been reinforced to me is a lesson that I was taught in university in 1972, which is to say that people's expectations of the future is set by their experience in the immediate past. And most people's experience in the immediate past is fairly good. There were lots of fears, lots of economic fears, and most of those fears were overcome as a consequence of, as an example, quantitative easing. My belief is that it is likely that the uh, understanding of the reality of inflation is something that might not occur for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, or well, probably fortunately for me, because I compete against most people, uh, most people's time frames are too short to be relevant. A, a different question uh, evolves uh, around the delta between the gold price performance and the performance of the gold equities. As you suggest, there is a fairly great delta between the performance of bullion and the performance of the mining shares. And I think that's really perhaps due to three factors. The first is in prior bull markets, the momentum has to be established by bullion, and there hasn't been enough momentum established by bullion uh, for that momentum to translate down to the mining equities, particularly because as the bullion price has increased, the price of producing gold, the cost of producing gold, pardon me, the wage, wage costs, in particular the social rents, taxes and royalties and regulation, but also consumables like energy has increased. So despite the fact that the gold price has increased, margins haven't increased as much as equity investors would like to see. Uh, this takes care of itself if the gold price continues to go up, of course. But I think another difficulty that the gold equities face is the underperformance of gold companies as companies. I believe that the paradigm around gold equities was established in the 1970s when the gold price went from $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. And the consequence of that is that what investors looked at, looked for in a gold equity was a leveraged way to play gold. In other words, they looked for optionality. Looking for optionality is the same as looking for marginality because the least efficient companies, the companies with the uh, lowest operating margins are the ones that experience the greatest margin increase as a consequence of higher gold prices. If you're looking for optionality, you're looking for marginal companies. And the gold industry was decidedly marginal for 50 years. Uh, in fact, uh, most years lost money. 
In fact, Aditya, as you and I have talked before, there are suggestions that in the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price uh, increased from the mid 250s to about $1,900, the free cash flow for the producers as expressed by the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Stock Index actually declined. The fact that a sevenfold increase in the commodity price was meant by a decline in the sector's free cash flow understandably jaundiced a large number of investors, and all of that needs to be dealt with. I am of the opinion that investors now hold the gold mining industry to a much higher standard, whether or not that will continue uh, if the gold market continues is a, is a different discussion. But I think that a rising gold price uh, and a rising uh, degree of competence among management teams with regards to return on capital employed uh, will begin to drive gold equities.